This is the E of Real Estate. My guest today is uh, Lydia de Leon from Mexico. And uh, she's an architect and uh, wellness coach. Um, um, is Greek, uh, trained as architect uh, with a focus on the relationship that buildings have on health and well-being of people. And she also studied sustainable environmental design and uh, did a PhD on the effect of uh, geophysical anomalies uh, on living organisms. She has been uh, researching for more than 15 years uh, the relation of ancient temples and their location. And she is the author of the book, The Power of Sacred Locations. And she is also the creator of Healing Architecture and co-founder of uh, Geophilia. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I yes, really appreciate yes. our, our connection. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to this. Uh, um, because as architects, we uh, share the same uh, interest uh, in esoteric and the, and the mystical part of uh, architecture and the invisible forces that are also at work. And um, we will hopefully go a little bit deeper into that uh, during this uh, interview. And we are both Absolutely. on a quest, as I understood from my preparation, uh, um, to understand better the relationship between uh, the environment and the people within that environment. So, as I said, I'm really uh, excited about uh, this interview. Our fellow uh, architect, the famous one, uh, Bachmann Safilla, Fuller, once said, if you change the environment, you change the people. And one of my quotes that I uh, often use in my lectures, uh, show me your learned work environment and I tell you who you are. Um, Absolutely. And, in this podcast, I would like to uh, explore uh, your view about the relationship between environment and people. And maybe we uh, start uh, off with um, uh, your research on the sacred uh, uh, hotspots, uh, power spots, and the uh, temples, uh, about the anomalies you uh, found and yeah, how that affects people uh, in, that, in that specific place. Sure. Um, before I jump into this, I'd like to share something um, that actually complements what you mentioned from back Mr. Fuller uh, mm -hmm. with a little bit of scientific research, uh, because as you know, I like uh, all the esoteric and ancient traditions and all the scientific aspects. And I really think bridging them together is, you know, the golden ratio between them uh, mm -hmm. can give us uh, just truly the, the closest we can get to reality. And it's also um, bridging the, the masculine and the feminine aspect. And uh, I think that helps both sides of our brain uh, understand better um, the reality that we live in. So mm -hmm. what I wanted to add to this beautiful quote that you mentioned uh, is two things. One is the research of cell biologist, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, um, and for those of you in the audience that have not heard of him, uh, he discovered epigenetics. So he basically said, uh, he found out through cell research that the cells actually get sick depending on the environment that the cell membrane receives. So according to that fluid, the cell will uh, just uh, react completely differently. So I realized after reading that book many, many years ago, it just touched me very deep that we are a colony of some trillion cells and the like liquid, the corresponding liquid that we have all around us is the space of our building and the building itself. So I realized that the same way he changed in his Petri dishes, different liquids and the cells actually reacted so differently the same way we put a colony of some trillion cells in a different environment of a building, for example, um, that has a different effect on the space itself in the qualities of the space. And then all our cells will respond very differently. So that's for me, the application of epigenetics in architecture. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. I have always been, and I have been personally um, affected by my own environment in the past and I had developed health, health issues because of that. I will 
I will share that in a bit. Um, and the second piece of research I wanted to uh, add to this is the research done um, by the Blue Zones. So again, for those of you who have never listened about it, of course, you can uh, search online and read about it. It's a magnificent research. Uh, so the Blue Zones, it was a research done many years ago, and they found out that there are five places around the world that people have the highest longevity. Uh, one is in Greece. It's actually in, in, in my homeland. It's an island called Ikaria. There is one in Japan. There is one in California. Uh, there is Sardinia. Um, so there are these five zones. And the main researcher that, that did all this analysis, he shared that the number one parameter for people's longevity and happiness was their environment. And I was very surprised by that. And of course, by environment, we mean a lot of things. But firstly, is the houses we live in, the secondary environment, which is what is around, you know, our, our house and our building. Uh, is there uh, tons of radiation and noise and pollution? Is there um, informational pollution? You know, is, is, is it an area that everybody is just stressed and sad and devastated because that is registered in the informational field and we are receiving it? Either we are aware of it or not. Um, so what is the, that environment? Um, and also the quality, is it polluted? Is it clean? Is there pure air? So all of these factors, I was surprised to see that played the biggest role from his research. So I just wanted to add these two things. Mm -hmm. um, so many years ago, I, I was living in an apartment that I had just moved in. It was a very uh, new apartment, just freshly built. And within one year, I found myself not being able to sleep in my own bed anymore. I started sleeping in the couch. Uh, I didn't know what was wrong with my place. Everything was brand new. My bed was brand new. My mattress was new. I ended up sleeping for one whole year, believe it or not, in a second little room that I had that was only for yoga, meditation, and these things. It was a little room, so it was not big enough to have a bedroom. And I slept in the floor over uh, some uh, uh, like uh, um, rugs and things to, to keep me. It was a wooden floor, so it was warm, but it was tough, you know, but I slept so much better there in the floor than in my own bed. So that um, also the question around temples uh, that always fascinated me, like why are temples placed in so specific locations and what is in common led me to diving even deeper into this subject of geophysical anomalies. What are geophysical anomalies? They are just places where the value of the different fields, the geomagnetic field, the gravity field, and other natural Earth's fields vary significantly. So it's either a place where we have like a, uh, an increase in these values or a decrease. Uh, later on, I realized that I was, my bed was actually over um, underground water. So that was one of the reasons that I was sleeping so bad. Plus, uh, my mattress at that time, uh, even though when I bought it, I had asked for a non-metal um, mattress, it actually had metal. So not only I was sleeping on an anomaly, but my bed itself, it was just acting as an antenna for all this. Um, this uh, basically, it's an electromagnetic anomaly. And I, I was actually measuring my body voltage on the bed and outside of the bed, and it was like 20 times higher over the bed. So I, I freaked out at that time. Then I started looking for solutions. Um, but it was, this was like kind of the beginning of my journey. And earlier from that, I always had a lot of questions about temples that none of the research or the books that I read really satisfied my appetite for some science. Um, it was just uh, reached up to a level, but it didn't fulfill my craving. So 
From there, I launched to do a five-year research PhD uh, with, a, with a Greek prof professor of uh, geophysics and another professor of medicine because I had to gap, um, I had to find a way to bridge that gap between geophysics, architecture, and medicine. So mm -hmm. how actually can a building um, relate to the earth location and what is underneath it and how can that affect biology in general, not just humans, but animals and plants as well? And how is that related to temple? So that was a fascinating journey. It, it uh, just led me to many places. I met remarkable people around the world. I travel a lot. I, I did a lot of trainings and seminars. And uh, well, I can say <laughs> humbly enough that I reached some conclusions that I think they're pretty solid and valid. And of course, um, this is a big field to explore and there is always more things to explore. Uh, but let's say the, the, the condensed conclusion, <laughs> so it's easier for everybody listening, um, is basically that these anomalies can, let's say, um, weaken our immune system. And from there, uh, we can have various health issues for most people and not for all people, because we all are different and we all have different sensitivities. Like there are people that are electrosensitive and there are people that have sensitivity in their lungs and with a little bit of dust, you know, they are coughing and some people not. So it's the same with these geophysical anomalies. But over the long term, and please remember this part, it's really important. Over the long term, most people will develop um, some sort of health issue. Now, the interesting thing that I found, because this was has always been told in, in various research, uh, especially, you know, from people that have used uh, dowsing and they are talking about earth grids and all these things that, you know, they cause cancer and all these things. But what happens in the short term? So I started to look into that and I found out that there is a phenomenon that is called hormesis. And this phenomenon can be applied to any agent. And this phenomenon says that any agent that is stressful can be uh, problematic over a long-term period of exposure, but can actually be beneficial over a short-term period of exposure. Mm. So that applies to homeopathy, that applies to dieting and fasting, you know, short-term fasting is incredible for the body, it regenerates all the cells, long-term fasting, it will just destroy the body for most people. Uh, the same goes for exercise and the same goes for drugs, pharmaceutical drugs. You know, if you exceed a dosage, they can be extremely problematic, right? So there is an optimum dosage for things. That's basically the conclusion from the hormesis um, phenomenon. So I looked into radiation hormesis and it's actually there. I found a lot of research and that started to make sense to me. And also um, there is very interesting research uh, showing that we already know, for example, that cell phones can create uh, problems in the brain and cancers and things like that. We already know that, but there is another incredible piece of research that shows that um, there were some people using microwave radiation, like the same that mobile phones use, to cure cancer in rats. So how is that possible? That's possible because we're talking about the short-term exposure. We're not talking about having your phone all day next to your head for every day of your life. <laughs> we're talking about very specific dosage, lower dosage and very short-term exposure. So then I started thinking about temples. So I found, I, I started analyzing temples around the world and this is obviously an on, ongoing process and it will, you know, probably take most of my life because there is always more to, mm -hmm. to research. 
Um, but uh, most of them that I have looked until now uh, seem to just be located in a place where there is underground water or there is an underground fault or some other type of geophysical anomaly, which I go on in this research in the book also to analyze what type of geophysical anomalies there is. And this is something I couldn't find anywhere in bibliography. This is something I just did from scratch. I mean, to put together and make these categories. Um, so most temples, especially the ones built up to the 1500s, because I think after that, the knowledge was lost or, you know, hidden and then people built things and churches and, and cathedrals that didn't have this original design. But the rest of them have one of these categories, interestingly enough. So the question I had is how, why would they put the temple on an area that is distorted? And for example, a fault is a distorted area. It doesn't give you a stable ground. So it wouldn't make sense practically to place it over a fault, right? You, if, you, if you already know where it is. Um, so I, I started to figure out that it has to do something with electromagnetism. Uh, and because then I looked into all the parameters of the temple building and they seem like they are all amplifying electromagnetic fields from the materials, from the geometry, etc. So then I just put this puzzle together. Okay, they were using radiation hormesis, apart from other things that the temple was made for. Um, they used it on a short term because no one was living in a temple. Even the priests were living somewhere outside. Um, maybe sometimes close, but uh, not inside the, the building itself. So the people that arrived there, they were exposed short term in this geophysical anomaly that was amplified by the temple. And then I got it. And that, of course, can be used for many things. For example, in ancient Greece, there was in the temples of Asclepios that were healing temples um, by definition, people went there to, to get healed, they had what they called um, like a therapeutic sleep. It was part of the protocol. So you would sleep only for one night in the temple. And before that, you had to go through a cleanse and a fast and a prayer. And the God would appear in your dream and will tell you what you need to do to get healed. Or in some circumstances, people will just wake up next morning healed. So that was curious that they will put the people to sleep in the temple, but only for one night. You couldn't do more than that. So that kept on just adding to, to my um, definition of why you know, they really used the temples and placed them in these specific locations that had all these geophysical anomalies. So that has been like the short, uh, <laughs> like uh, short explanation of, of my research. Um, and I don't know if you yeah, want that's, to ask that's, something more that specific is really, on that. Yeah, 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 that's really great <clears throat> because I hear you saying, um, I hear you saying that uh, it is mainly because of the anomalies in a certain spot. So, of course, this uh, uh, very, uh, how we say, uh, uh, explanatory what you are telling, uh, I wasn't aware of that, uh, short-term and long-term uh, exposure. But is there a way that we can use this uh, finding in contemporary buildings? The existing ones, preferable, but also when we build new ones, uh, so not that we are going to find a location to build it on, but it is already there and there, is, uh, there are mm -hmm. existing fields. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Uh, so how can you, yes, use, well, in, how can you apply modern... this knowledge in the contemporary existing buildings? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in modern times, it's very sad especially if someone is aware of all this information like me and you, to see uh, architects and construction firms just build 
anywhere, you know, without any awareness of how this location or this material or this geometry can affect the people inside and outside also. Um, because when you, you are aware of all this uh, information and how the effect can be so intense, uh, you look at a city and it's like, it's the whole city is built in an unconscious way. Like, what am I going to do? Just bombard it and, <laughs> you know, build it from scratch? Well, that's not a very sustainable option. But, um, well, in terms of that aspect, when we have an existing building, um, there are things we can do. I mean, the work we do in geophilia uh, involves a lot of other things. I mean, it's not just the location, right? We take care of materials and indoor air quality and geometry. So when there is an existing building, we can improve as much as we can, um, things like that. And if we do the analysis of that place and we see that there is a geophysical anomaly, um, there are some um, remedies we use, which actually will reduce significantly the side effects of um, that anomaly um, being in the house. Of course, it's very important, and I always say that, where is that anomaly located? If it's under the bed, then that's the most problematic. So the first idea is, can we move the bed? Can we change the bedroom? In some cases, I have asked people to change a bedroom and, and you know, uh, go to another room and make this room for another use. Why? Because uh, while we sleep, the body turns off all its defense mechanisms because it needs to heal and regenerate. So if there is a stressor, any stressor, noise is a stressor, or um, like uh, light pollution is another stressor. And of course, a geophysical electromagnetic anomaly is one of them. It doesn't let the body to completely turn off, relax and regenerate. So on the long term, that can end up as immune problems because the body doesn't have space to heal. It's always on the alert because it always has something to fight and take care of. So the bed is the most important. So in the last, uh, as a last solution, if we cannot uh, move the bed or change a room, for example, um, there is a special mattress that we use over the existing mattress of the bed that actually creates uh, a very harmonious field. This is actually what I used in my original bed in, in that apartment that I shared before, where I was sleeping in the floor to avoid what I didn't know was at that time a geophysical anomaly. And after I, I had this technology in my bed, I returned to my bed without changing the location. And I did it also as an experiment because I'm very sensitive to that. Also, there are other uh, technologies we can use if it's in another area of the house, you know, that they create a very harmonic field and they transform um, the existing field into a more bioavailable field, a field that is more easy for our biology to manage. Um, our approach uh, is we cannot shield I don't agree with this idea personally. I know there are things there, um, shielding electromagnetic things, only in very few circumstances I would recommend that because when you shield, um, you shield a lot of things. You don't only shield what you don't want, but you also shield what you do want. And what you do want is there is a beneficial background radiation coming from the earth and there is cosmic radiation also that is beneficial. And we need that. Actually, there are studies showing that when we cut off completely from terrestrial radiation, um, there are problems, immune system and hormonal problems. Uh, so in every case, there are different solutions. Then, of course, when we're talking for a modern architecture, for a new building, uh, the best thing is that, you know, we do the analysis of the land and then we know uh, a lot of things come out of this analysis. We know if there is a fault or there is underground water or there are uh, just areas to avoid because they have, let's say, less coherence, right? So we choose 
to place our building in a neutral area or in a more beneficial area. Now, people ask me about modern temples. Well, um, this is not something that is so much in fashion. I mean, apart from the traditional Christian churches, right? I mean, talking about the Western world, <clears throat> obviously, if you go to Asia, you know, they value so much the building of temples. It's a different culture there. Um, but if we are designing a new temple, then of course, in that case, uh, you will want to put it on a geophysical anomaly. That's the only building that you will want to place that. And you will want to make sure, of course, that it's used uh, on a short term. And th there has to be a respect for that building. Um, when it's built to these uh, traditional ways, uh, which include the placement on the earth, uh, they include their specific measurements or sacred measurements, as they were called. Um, they include archaeoastronomy, geometry, very, very like precise geometry, and also materials, you know, sometimes materials brought from very far away uh, for a specific reason. So if you create this incredible being that is called a temple, you need to have respect for it. So it's a very powerful um, field that these temples create. So of course, then you have to make sure it's short term and it's also um, approached with respect. That's, that's the mm -hmm. way I see it. Yeah, yeah you uh, uh, said something about uh, houses where people live and about uh, the sleep period. Some people sleep uh, six to eight hours, eight, nine hours a day. Um, could we uh, explore a little bit for a working uh, place, for instance, an office? Because uh, in the traditional office, uh, you also for a long time on the on the same spot. Um, what could people do there? And uh, is it something the uh, the employee could do by him or herself, or is it something the employer should uh, make available? In the work environment, I absolutely believe that it's the employer that should do something, but not many employers have that awareness and they don't have the information, obviously. Like, we need to educate people in these aspects of how the buildings, not only with their location, but with their materials and with, for example, uh, mechanical ventilation. I was working in London many years ago in a sustainability team in a big office. And there I, I saw so much and I learned so much about M&E, like mechanical electrical engineering part of sustainability. So if you have, for example, a, a mechanical ventilation system and it doesn't have proper filters, and it doesn't get clean properly, then you have a very bad indoor air quality, full of positive ions and full of dust and things like that. So people working there, they will suffer on the long run uh, from their respiratory system. So it's a lot of things we have to take care in a work environment. And definitely one of them is the, the geophysical anomalies, but I, I also think materials and, and indoor air quality um, also light, natural lighting. Uh, I know there are people um, working in big companies that they are very far away from a window. They don't even get in view. You know, they're all day in this cubicle um, of a computer. And uh, that's very problematic because you are there eight hours every day, five, hour, five days a week, you know, all year long almost. Um, so that's a long exposure. So educating companies about their workspaces, I think it's something very important. Yeah, and the same goes, of course, for uh, hospitals uh, and school buildings, universities. Oh, uh... don't get me there. <laughs> don't get me there. That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's, I don't know. I really think that the way we design hospitals at this time, in modern mm. times, um, I don't think there, there could be anything worse in, in yeah. this design. I mean, um, building design of a hospital is a place for the sick, right? It should be a place for getting healing. Yes. 
Yes. It's, a, it's a completely different concept. How do I make a space uh, so even when I enter, I get, I, I get to feel better, right? It, it should be a place that the instant you enter, you yeah. emotionally and psychologically feel better, right? Yeah. Not worse. I, I, I don't think there is anyone that could tell me, oh, I actually went inside a hospital and I felt better. No. But um, again, we are so focused only on the Western scientific method and we forget everything else. We forget we are a holistic being. We have emotions. Uh, we have uh, our energy field. Uh, there are so many things going on when we enter a space. So for example, there could be healing frequencies. There, there could be use of specific colors, paintings, uh, something just to lighten up everything. And of yeah. course, healthy materials. Uh, of course, there could be things for the ventilation to add negative ions in. I mean, I could go on and on because this is something it's, yeah. I don't know, I'm very passionate about. Um, yeah. I have been through a lot with my family, you know, seeing them going into hospitals and I, I was there. And it's just a place to make you feel worse, unfortunately. I'm sorry to say yeah. that. I mean, in terms of design, um, you know, I appreciate everybody that is designing hospitals. I don't mean to judge anyone, but it really could be so much better and it should be so much better. Should yeah. be a place to enter and get yeah. healing as it was in the past times. It was the most sacred place to go into a healing place. Exactly. I, I agree fully. Uh, so many points I can touch on now. Uh, let me start with uh, <laughs> one. Uh, you said it already yourself that uh, in the in your research for the um, uh, temple sites, it, it had to do with electromagnetic fields. And uh, as you know, and you said it also, that uh, also material are uh, radiating electromagnetic fields. And nowadays we have a lot of man-made uh, uh, of these fields, like uh, 5G, uh, Wi-Fi, and 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 so on. Um, but there's another one, and also that you said, that is our own uh, etheric field. So there's a complete uh, cocktail of uh, frequencies that is going on in, in a built environment or in the environment in general. So it is not only the, the location, not only the physical thing on top of it, it is the digital part of it, but also the social part, how people feel in that. Uh, and um, there's a strange thing that... Uh, Somehow we have this knowledge, but it is uh, uh, scattered all over the place. Uh, although in retail, they understand this. Because there they use all the psychological tricks to make people buy something that they don't need. Uh, <laughs> so when that is possible, those same people exactly. so now and then get sick. So we could use similar uh, techniques in a hospital or make uh, students more curious in uh, schools and universities. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, the two of us and hopefully some more uh, have to do <laughs> some missionary work uh, to uh, educate the people and, and, and to show them the possibilities uh, because it has a huge benefit. Uh, it, it has an, an, an uh, back to the offices, it has an effect on, on the performance of people. So it is a strategic issue, actually. It is not a cost issue, it is very strategic. <laughs> And you that, know, uh, again, yeah. I'm sad to say that, but um, the governments globally, they don't want people to get healthy, unfortunately. If we wanted that, our healthcare system will be very different. And of course, the design of hospitals will be very different. As I said, the first thing you would notice if they would use the same, as you already explained, the same psychological tricks that they used for you know, they have golden ratio in your credit card. So you love to take it out and look at it and use it. You know, it's so simple. <laughs> um, they could do so many things in a hospital. So you just enter and you feel so good. Just by entering there, you feel like a relief, like, oh, I can relax here. I'm, I'm calmer. Instead, you feel the opposite. You get worse, you get stressed, you get fear. Um, you know, there is not a sense of tranquility. And only if you find an inner tranquility can you heal, right? You cannot heal in an environment stressful with the worst light, with noise, uh, you know, with the worst materials. 
unfortunately. So <clears throat> this starts from, you know, we are, we are going through a very tough time in, in our world right now, and we can see what I've just mentioned mm. um, full on just exploding everywhere. If, if like governments and advertisement companies, they had a, a health as a focus, then we would listen very different things in TV, right? We would listen about how to maintain a healthy immune system, uh, how to manage better your emotions, yeah. uh, how to change your belief system and, and your, your thoughts, you know, so your body reacts better towards what you want. So we would hear <laughs> so many different things, right? But we don't. Yeah. Instead, well, that, we that... get a drug commercial, yeah. you know, and whatever else. Yeah. Yeah, you, you touch an interesting point now that uh, there are some employers who are uh, uh, more holistic. Uh, so they could give us, us an example how to do it. And, and that brings me to the point um, where to start. Is it the, the, the chicken or the egg? Uh, so you can um, <laughs> improve the whole environment as we are talking about eh, the physical, but also the digital uh, and partly also the social, with whom are you interacting? How is the culture? How is the management style and so on? Uh, or do we start with the individual and he gets more, he or she gets more resilient. So indeed, I fully agree. You don't have to uh, shield things off, uh, just get uh, used to it and, and, and find a way to, to uh, work with it. Uh, um, so how maybe you can uh, tell us something about uh, how you integrate your uh, wellness coaching and your architecture, because I think that is exactly this point, the chicken and the egg story. Uh. <laughs> so whose, yeah, whose sure. responsibility is it? Uh, is, it the, is it the employer and or uh, the employee or, or sh should we uh, look at the building? Like uh, you have those uh, children uh, bicycles with uh, aiding uh, wheels to support it. So there's more balance. So you have your two wheels and two extra in the back uh, to balance. So <laughs> should we uh, look at a building like that? It's just aiding wheels to us as individuals to develop? Well, listen, um, it's always easy to put the... I think the responsibility on somewhere else, you know, all oh, the government's fault, it's yeah. the employer's fault, he didn't know, but what are we doing as individuals to help? Exactly. So, of course, if, if the employer doesn't have any awareness and there is an employee that has the awareness, go and talk, you know, uh, give them some things to, to, to read, uh, recommend a book or a, or a published paper or uh, an online website or something that they can read through and say, well, that looks very interesting. And educating one another, I think, is the most important thing of our times, you know, passing on important information that can help all of us, you know, each other to wake up and, and understand things that we are not aware of. So this is one of them, absolutely building health and how the building with all its parameters from its uh, layout, uh, internal layout, I mean, its materials, its geometry, can affect our health and well-being, and of course, our productivity at work. So it, it should be that, yes, the employer is responsible because um, he selects the place, he, he gets uh, the people employed, and. Um, he's responsible in a way, but maybe he doesn't have the information on it. You know, maybe someone comes to me and tells me, Lydia, oh, there is this subject of whatever, I don't know, that you're not aware of. And I will say, okay, thank you so much. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you for informing me. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the same way, I think just most people, and it's always so easy to get there, right? Most people get lost in daily chores and stress and finances and oh you know I, I i didn't even have the space or the time to read about all these things <laughs> one can say right so i think we all have a responsibility of sharing what we know and yeah. uh, otherwise it's it's very easy to to put always the responsibility on someone else and, and just pinpoint a finger yeah. and say oh you know you should have done this 
Um, but what did I do to help that? You know, if I'm there. Um, so, and, yeah. And maybe this whole uh, COVID uh, experience uh, we're undergoing as a uh, world population uh, could be a blessing in disguise because we uh, touched on working uh, from home more than before. Uh, hybrid working is the new buzzword. Uh, so uh, you could say that will uh, aid the short term, short term exposure of th these uh, electromagnetic uh, fields in certain places. So, uh, so there is an opportunity, I would say, when people will be more aware that uh, you just, uh, yeah, select your places uh, where you stay for a while and, and do whatever you have to do. Uh, yes. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. You asked me something before about the integration of um, like wellness and all these things in our yes. work. Um, basically, I, I have done a lot of trainings in my life, firstly for myself on uh, self-improvement, um, inner healing and also mm. uh, physical healing. And Arturo also is a trained psychologist. Um, Arturo is my husband that we have Geophilia together. And uh, so we integrate all these things. And actually in the design process of a building, we integrate that we do, uh, we have a stage that is like a psychological analysis. And I do some specific charts like five element charts and some other analysis that basically help us to understand the client better and also the client can understand themselves better. And through the process of the design of whatever we're doing, it's also a healing process for the client. So that's one of our goals. And that's how, let's say, we integrate that in our work. Yeah, there we have a similar approach because you can focus on the real estate people because of the building. You can focus on the facilities management uh, people uh, because of the services in that building. Uh, ICT, don't forget them uh, with all the radiation. Uh, but also uh, the HR department is very, very important. Uh, and when you uh, compare um, costs uh, all the time, say, oh, that is too expensive or too much cost and uh, accommodation costs are too high. But on average, it is only 10% of the total 100% cost annual. So the, the, the largest uh, 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 costs are uh, employees, uh, personnel, 70 to 80 percent. So what would be more uh, logical to do? Focus on make from 10, 9 or optimize 70, 80 uh, percent. And uh, so that is my approach to, uh, to, to try to convince them with management language uh, that uh, it is really, as I said before, a strategic opportunity, uh, all these new findings. And actually, it is, it is uh, refinding because the ancient people knew about this. Uh, only we forgot. And we are yes. rediscovering it. Uh, yes, and also uh, the, the, the new science that is uh, leading edge uh, is rediscovering what is already written in ancient books and the Vedas and... Uh, from thousand years ago uh, and so on. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, one more question about, um, uh, can you share a little bit about your biggest struggles so far with uh, discovering all these new uh, findings uh, and uh, trying to uh, <laughs> implement them or... Uh, uh, teach people about it, uh, and how have you overcome them? Maybe one or two, uh, wow. as an that's example. A, that's a very, yeah, very, very deep question for me. Um, I think my biggest struggle was doing the PhD itself. That had, um, I mean, the research itself that turned into a PhD, I was, I didn't begin, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to do a PhD. I started the research and then, the professor appeared and he told me that I always wanted to have like a student to do this subject. So, you know, it, it just happened like that. But, mm. oh, man, that was a decision that cost me so much. <laughs> Why? Because um, I, firstly, I had to, uh, let's say, let go a lot of things in my life and I just had to focus so much in research. So for the first at least three years and a half, 
I was just every day in a pile of books and papers and all day reading and note, keeping notes. And then uh, one thing led me to another. So I was researching online. So it, that was a very magical journey. But at the same time, um, it just asked me to uh, give so much and let go of a lot of things in my life so I can focus. So that was that was challenging by itself. But I think the biggest challenge um, was the university because um, I had a I had a struggle with the university because they were not accepting what I was saying. For example, I was I was showing them publications that explain how underground water passing from a specific uh, material of high porosity uh, can create a charge, electromagnetic charge. And then the head of the university there in, in the department that I was, was telling me, no, uh, underground water is always um, neutral. And I have a whole bookshelf here of my books. You know, all my life have been teaching that. And you cannot just come and tell me that there is an electric current. So there is none. So universities, the same way <laughs> um, other establishments are, unfortunately, like the medical establishment, they have been turned into a religion in many, in many ways. So I had a very difficult time uh, passing my message, and then I ended up changing university and going to another one that they were far more uh, open-minded, and they had done research on how electromagnetism affects the body, and they were far more aligned with what I was doing, but I, I suffered a lot. Uh, I lost a lot. I lost money. I lost other things. I just struggled with a lot of stress for some years um, until I finished the research, um, so I think that has been my biggest struggle. And also um, with publications, uh, with journals, also uh, I, have, I have contacted many papers. Um, I have, you know, all my, my papers um, are very, let's say, backed up with tons of bibliography and everything is referenced. And even that, um, you know, they they give feedback, the journals give feedback that is like basically telling me, oh, you know, what you're saying is science fiction, <laughs> mm -hmm. even if everything is structured and very well organized. So that has been another struggle, which I know every scientist in their field that has done something more alternative, for example, Bruce Lipton, they yes. fired him from the university. He, he did one of the major findings, uh, discoveries of the century, which is epigenetics, which says more than 99% of global um, disease is not genetic, you know, mm -hmm. and that means you can do something about it. So instead of them saying, wow, this is incredible, we'll promote you, they fired him because they said, oh, no, we're just going to continue teaching genetics, you know. Yeah. So all all scientists that have done different things, including Nassim Haramein and Rupert Sheldrake and all these guys uh, that go away from the norm, which is what the scientism religion wants to say, yes. um, then there it's, it's difficult to publish. It's difficult to get your voice heard. You have to, you know, try again and again. And at some point you get a bit <laughs> frustrated and yes. defeated and, uh, you feel like um, you're you're getting too much, um, let's say, slap on the face. But um, well, I have been through all that, and I'm still here. I'm still sharing my message. I will publish more things, um, but definitely that has been my biggest challenge. But certainly, you are not defeated by that. Uh... Because I uh, read somewhere <laughs> on your website that you are preparing a new uh, um, research in, in Greek uh, uh, temples. And you gathered uh, some really uh, um, interesting uh, scientists uh, around the two of you, you and your husband, uh, to do so. Uh, can you tell us a little bit yes, about yes, the status quo of that uh, project? Initiative? Sorry, what? 
Can you tell us a little bit more about the status quo uh, of that initiative? How far yes, are you? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, um, we created this team, um, interdisciplinary team of there are professors, there are um, uh, people from the field of medicine, of geophysics, of electromagnetism and, and engineering, archaeology, history. There is so much involved. And it took us three years fighting kind of with the Greek archaeological authorities to try to take the permit. But we do have officially now, uh, since I think it's two years, um, the permit to make measurements, both geophysical measurements and biomedical measurements on people in 50 ancient Greek temples, including mm. temples of Asclepios, including the oracle places like Delphi and Delos, um, and many, many other important temples. So this was a huge win. It was tons of work and it was not easy to, to, to go through. Um, but it was totally worth it. And now we are, since that time, uh, we are just in search of funding because every temple takes has a lot of cost to move all the people there. We have to stay there for you know a month or a month and a half, bring the people, measure them, uh, send the results for analysis, um, and all that. Uh, it's it takes um, a, a, an important budget. So. Uh, we have some uh, potential funding now from uh, from Greece, uh, but uh, we're just waiting for that. And then um, that, that's also going to be international because uh, we are planning to do similar measurements in Teotihuacan in Mexico and also uh, different uh, stone circles in Europe. And then, I mean, there are more and more temples that we want to do that around the world, but uh, it's all a matter of finding the funding for every for every specific place, for every specific temple. Yeah, when I um, um, may give you a suggestion, uh, you always need a control group in this type uh, of research. Uh, maybe you take a hospital as a control group because the people are already there and they will not move. They stay there 24-7 uh, or an office building or a school um, because I'm trying to uh, uh, create myself uh, a, a similar uh, project, a pilot project, but then a measure in, in, um, in a university environment. And unfortunately, I also have similar experience uh, as you have that Although you would expect that in a university, they are open for innovation, new thinking, uh, because that's, uh, <laughs> the layman will understand that's a university all about, uh, finding uh, new things, the truth. Uh, but no, it is exactly as you described that uh, it is difficult uh, to uh, change habits and thoughts and beliefs. Um, but anyway, I think uh, proof is a very strong uh, uh, argument. Uh, and uh, yeah, when you feel better, uh, as we say that uh, uh, earlier, before we started the conversation, uh, Ibrahim Karim, the, the Egyptian architect, uh, he did several studies, uh, did some interventions and then took them away later on. And, and people came back, please place them back because we feel there is something missing. Uh, um. <laughs> so that would be really nice. Yes, the, the university, the university clinic that he did the studies um, on, just uh, said we are not going to publish this mm. this research. So, yeah, you you expect because you know we come from a, a mentality that is we want things to evolve, we want mm. progress, we want to new things to come out and you know you go with this mentality uh, but you see then that most universities wants to stay in the middle ages so no this is what we're teaching and we're not going to change it so yeah that sometimes has made me very sad but of course i'm not giving up there there are brilliant people around the world even universities and uh yeah. We just have to keep trying and, and we'll find a way around it. Yeah, I, I, again, I think that uh, COVID is a blessing in disguise here that uh, yeah, students are not allowed, uh, are not uh, only on the strict restrictions uh, to go to universities. 
So I think there will come a, uh, a, a, a counter, uh, how we say, a revolution uh, that students are going to ask for it. Uh, because, yeah, information is all over the place. Uh, at the fingertip, you can reach almost everything via the internet. Um, and hopefully this uh, podcast will uh, be a small building block for that. <laughs> so... Oh, we could go on hours, um, but I think um, this is a good <laughs> moment to uh, to stop this uh, this episode. Um, I thank you so much, and as I expected, uh, we are like minded and uh, yeah, on the same frequency, um, which is great. And uh, who knows how we can cooperate and and uh, help each other uh, make uh, next steps and uh, spread the message. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, uh, Lydia. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, see you soon. Thank you so much for the invitation, Renee. It's a pleasure to connect with you. We are so much on the same uh, wavelength. And for everybody listening, I, I would like to share um, a free resource that is in our website. Uh, if you just go to geophilia.org, uh, you leave your email and you can download a free PDF, which is a condensed version of long years of research around sleep. So it's it's called the seven secrets for creating a sleep sanctuary. You can learn a lot of things from there. I'm really passionate about the sleep um, in our lives because it's a, such a important base for good health, emotional, physical, spiritual well-being. So Anybody wants, you can just read it there. Um, thank you again so much. Lovely to connect and hope we uh, do this again at some point soon. Yes, yes. And uh, thank you for adding at uh, this point. I will uh, add uh, the link uh, in the uh, subscription download uh, down the, this video uh, because uh, this is a great way for people to experience themselves in their own time. And then hopefully this will help to uh, uh, spread the message. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, Renee. Have a lovely day.